Good afternoon. I'm going to uh, ask people to go ahead and take their seats uh, as we begin uh, breakout session 5C uh, on sustainable development. Very good. My name is Andrew Gaughan. Uh, I uh, am a class of 2009 graduate of the University of Maryland, uh, and I was a student of Professor Percival's, uh, and it's a great honor to be back here. I now uh, serve as a senior clean energy program manager at the Maryland Energy Administration, where I focus on uh, wind energy deployment in Maryland. Um, I am very pleased to be uh, accompanied today by a, a very accomplished uh, panel of uh, environmental law experts. Um, some who I'm just meeting today and some who I have worked with in the past, or one who I've worked with in the past. Um, I am going to uh, briefly um, just uh, go through the, the name and the uh, topic area that uh, folks are going to cover today, and then, uh, and then I will uh, give a more in-depth bio and introduction uh, before, uh, before individuals actually present their, uh, their presentation for the panel discussion today. Um, Joining us today is David Bugelmans, uh, a uh, current, is that right, University of Law student here at, at Maryland? Graduate. Graduate, okay, very good. Uh, and who I had the pleasure to work with at the Maryland Energy Administration, uh, and who, uh, my understanding is, will be joining us as a clean energy program manager uh, at, the, at MEA. Uh, so I certainly look forward to that, and I uh, was very impressed with his work uh, during his time there previously. Um, that, uh, David will be speaking on comparing U.S. and German policies to promote distributed solar PV growth of the triumph of the feed-in tariff. Um, David will be followed by Mark Kapins Eritja, is that right? Eritja, um, from the University of Barcelona in Spain, uh, and she will be focusing on what role for renewable energy in international law. Uh, she will be followed by Professor Rob Fowler from the Law School of uh, the University of South Australia. Uh, and uh, who will be discussing, uh, addressing the challenge of sustainable development, the need for a global clean energy treaty. Uh, and finally, uh, we'll, um, we'll hear from David Hodas, uh, a professor at the Widener University School of Law, uh, who will be discussing uh, a global law of sustainable energy. Um, and there are you know, significant uh, commonalities to a lot of these presentations. Um, and as we go through them, I would just ask folks to think about uh, what strategies that governments have used to advance renewable energy when they don't have access to strong governance mechanisms and centralized policy? How effective have intergovernmental agreements and treaties been in changing behavior? How have supporters of renewable energy in different parts of the world addressed backlash and efforts to reverse sustainable energy policies? How has the global economic crisis affected public support for international cooperation on climate and energy? And also, what lessons can U.S. policymakers learn from the rest of the world about deployment of renewable energy and vice versa? So without further ado, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, David Bugelmans. He is a May 2012 graduate, uh, so I apologize for that oversight, uh, of the University of Maryland Francis King Carey School of Law. <laughs> completed the law school's environmental law certificate program with an interdisciplinary focus on renewable energy development and policy. During law school, David interned at the Maryland Energy Administration, uh, the Department of Energy Loan Program, and in the United States House of Representatives for the Committee of Natural Resources. Once he completes and hopefully passes the bar exam, David will return to the Maryland Energy Administration as a clean energy program manager. He's originally from Palo Alto, California, and holds a BA in politics with honors from the University of California, Santa Cruz. So it's my great pleasure to welcome David Bugelmans. All right, thank you, uh, Andrew. So, yeah, that's correct. I'm a May 2012 graduate of this law school. I'm currently uh, studying for the Maryland bar exam. So this is really a, a, an amazing opportunity, and I really appreciate you guys uh, letting me speak to you today. Um, the topic of my presentation is going to be, um, this is based off of a, a presentation I actually prepared for uh, Professor Percival's class that he asked uh, me to expand on up for today. Um, it's really a comparative study of the policies of the United States and, uh, sorry about that, and uh, Germany uh, to promote distributed solar photovoltaic uh, development, just looking very narrowly at solar PV growth. Sarah, am I doing something wrong with the... What's that? So, um, all right, let's begin. Um, actually, before I begin, let me just uh, start with a preface here. Um, 
when I, folk, when I uh, developed this presentation, you know, I realized it's an international audience. So really what I think this would be useful for is for people to gain an understanding of how the energy regulatory uh, framework works in the United States and how that relationship plays in with the states and to realize the limits on the states um, for further uh, research. So first off, why compare uh, the United States and Germany? Well, first off, the numbers. Um, the United States has a total installed photovoltaic capacity of 4 gigawatts. Germany has 25 gigawatts. So you look at just the numbers, there must be something going on here. Um, the United States is also trending towards large utility scale installations. Germany, on the other hand, it's uh, trending towards distributed installations. The majority of their solar panel installations are going to be on rooftops of uh, residential customers, industrial customers, um, commercial customers. Um, so there's that disparity there. Another reason why I think this comparison is interesting is just the solar resources of the two countries. Um, this is the map from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory comparing the solar resources of Germany and the United States. If you see here um, the red, um, Germany actually has about the same solar resources as Alaska. And for those Americans here, Americans know that Alaska isn't known for the amount of sunlight, sunlight it receives or its great weather. Um, if you compare it to the rest of the United States, I mean, it's obvious that, you know, there's something going on here. Also, Germany is only slightly bigger than the fourth largest state of Montana. So again, you know, what is driving this growth? So this part of my presentation, I'm just going to run through the um, main um, renewable energy development policy of Germany, EEG, um, in English, it's Renewable Energy Sources Act. Um, I'm just going to run through it very quickly and then name off uh, three reasons why um, it's led to the growth you see in Germany. Um, it's been the law of the land since the year 2000, although before Germany experimented with uh, other policies. Um, what it does at a very basic level is it creates feed and tariffs. I'm sure a lot of you here know what those are, but I'm just going to run through quickly with you all. Um, feed and tariffs require fixed term contracts between electricity suppliers and renewable energy system owners at rates offering a guaranteed and reasonable uh, return on investment. Um, EEG says 20 year contract terms. Um, it's designed to ensure a rate of return of 6 to 8% uh, percent, uh, for system owners. Um, this slide runs through two sections of the law um, that specifically pertain to distributed solar PV uh, development. There's other, obviously, the law targets other forms of uh, renewable energy um, uh, technology, but these are just two ones that's, uh, that are at the subject of my uh, paper here. Um, section 331 says, says tariff rates based on system size of uh, rooftop installations selling electricity into the grid. Section 332, on the other hand, actually provides a premium payment for electricity consumed on site. So even though there's no electricity delivered into the grid, under Section 332, um, installation owners still receive a subsidy. Um, and actually, when you take into account issues like taxes and electricity costs, the um, subsidy is going to be greater under 332 than under 331. Um, originally, owners could pick and choose between these two sections. Um, as of April 2012, at least 15% of the electricity must be consumed on site. Um, all my research indicated that that's not going to have too much of an impact because of the high retail rates of electricity um, in Germany. So you still have that incentive there. So really briefly, three main reasons for the success of EEG. There's other reasons. Um, but I think these are really uh, useful proxies for comparing uh, what's going on in Germany to what's going on in the United States. So the first re reason is that EEG sets tariff rates that ensure a reasonable rate of return uh, for investors in a granular fashion. Um, it's a 6 to 8% return on investment. That's their target. They've always, obviously had trouble um, making sure the target, uh, or making sure the rates actually achieve the target and not too much. And that's what's, what's been going on uh, recently in the country. Um, when I say granular fashion, it targets uh, different installations based on system size. Um, so obviously smaller projects um, are going to require a little bit more of a subsidy. Um, larger projects are not because of economies of scale. Um, the second reason is that EEG creates uh, certainty, certainty through a 20-year uh, contract set at the tariff rates at the time of contract formation. So really what this does is it creates certainty. Um, system owners can say, okay, I'm going to be able to pay back my system and make uh, some money off these uh, things. Um, and just creates certainty, which as you'll see is lacking in the United States. The third reason 
is that EEG allows for unlimited system sizes, um, such that all electricity does not need to be consumed on site. Again, that's another problem with the United States of how um, many states try to subsidize distributed solar PV growth. So what's holding the states back? And this is really the crux of uh, what I want to talk to you guys about today. Um, the short answer is that the current federal-state relationship, the way that electricity rates are, are transactions are regulated in this country, um, holds states back. It makes, them difficult, it makes it difficult for them to achieve those three factors that I just outlined for you all. And this really comes down to the interaction between two laws, the Federal Power Act of 1920 and PURPA, which we'll talk about in just a second. Um, the Federal Power Act of 1920 gives FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, jurisdiction over wholesale electricity uh, rates. States retain jurisdiction over uh, retail transactions. Um, FERC must improve wholesale transactions as just and reasonable. And I tack this on here for maybe some people uh, internationally who aren't familiar with this kind of thing. The jurisdiction for Congress to regulate this is the Commerce Clause. That was at the heart of the or one of the, the main issues in the health care uh, case that just came out last week. The Supreme Court has held that when an electron enters an interconnected grid, it is intermingled with all electrons in the grid, therefore it's in uh, interstate commerce. So the federal government uh, has jurisdiction over anything, even if it's an interstate uh, transaction. There is one exception, however, uh, to this relationship. It's for uh, qualified facilities. Um, this, these include uh, small solar uh, facilities um, under the Public Utilities Regulatory Policies Act of 1978. Um, what PURPA does is it allows states to require electricity suppliers to purchase electricity from qualified facilities at the utility's avoided cost. Um, this is kind of the term of art used in the statute. But really, it's just the price the utilities would have paid for the electricity had, they, um, had the qualified facility not sold the electricity into the grid. Um, this is going to be usually set by the cost of natural gas generated electricity because it's the last to be dispatched. Um, the issue has been that avoided cost, the avoided cost has not been enough to spur uh, solar PV growth and even wind or any other technology. Um, I think this is kind of an interesting nuance. California in 2007 actually tried to create a, create a feed and tariff, but what they did is they used this, um, this formulation in the law where instead of requiring a contract, they required utilities to offer to purchase electricity at pre-specified rates. And the thinking was that under this, uh, under this law, it wouldn't be um, a state requiring um, utilities to enter into a, a wholesale purchase of electricity. It was just an offer. And then FERC would have to go in and still improve it, prove it as just and reasonable. Um, through a series of events, FERC actually found that this constituted impermissible rate setting by the California Public Utility Commission. Um, if you actually look at the briefs, uh, CPUC argued um, the federal law should not preempt state law because of essentially the state's uh, compelling or the compelling nature and urgency of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, FERC did not agree. Um, what they did though is they clarified this a little bit. They said that under PURPA, states can create multi-tiered avoided cost rate structures for qualified facilities. Um, so basically when a state law requires that a certain percentage of electricity um, be covered uh, by a renewable source, you can calculate avoided cost based on that procurement requirement. Um, the issue with this, I think, is that the avoided cost of utilities is still going to be less than the renewable provider's cost. You still have to go through the approval of these rates as just and reasonable. Um, unbundled renewable portfolio standard laws also kind of detach the actual cost of the electricity um, from the, the price the utilities are going to pay. Also, net metering operates outside of the wholesale market. So I don't really, I'm not exactly sure how avoided cost is going to um, capture this. Um, I know that Vermont actually just amended its um, feed and tariff law to include this language as kind of a stopgap if their utility commission determines that the other way they're calculating tariff rates is preempted by federal law, but I just, I'm not quite sure how this is going to play out. And really, everything indicates to me that states cannot create the same targeted tariff rates under this uh, formulation as EEG. Um, avoided cost is going to always be an inaccurate proxy for offering distributed solar owners a reasonable return on their investments. So how am I doing on time? All right, 15 minutes? 15 minutes. So 
I'm going to run through just two basic policies that are used by states in the United States, kind of to get, not really to get around this, this uh, framework I just discussed, but they work within the framework. And I'm going to discuss some of the problems with these two policies. So the first one is net metering. So I'm pretty sure you know, most of you are familiar with net metering. Basically, it's where your meter runs backwards when you deliver electricity into the grid. Um, you know, during the day, your meter runs backwards. At night, you can use the lights, and you know, your electricity bill can be close to zero. I mean, that's the idea. You receive the retail rate for the electricity you produce because your meter is running backwards, so that's the subsidy. I identify this as almost a loophole because FERC found that this is actually acceptable under the relationship I just discussed because it is states regulating the retail sale of electricity. It's not a wholesale transaction. The subsidy is coming in through kind of the point of sale through your electricity meter, and therefore it's acceptable. Um, two basic problems with net metering uh, laws. Uh, system size caps. The incentive is generally going to be limited to what could be consumed on site. There's various ways that states try to get around this, but at the end of the day, I mean, you're going to be limited to what can be consumed, so you can't have someone install a huge solar array and, and reap the profits beyond what they can consume on site. Um, often these laws just include hard system size caps, um, and at the end of the day, this prevents the unlimited system sizes of EEG. Um, retail rates are often an inadequate, uh, I say proxy here, but it really is two things. First off, retail rates change. It's difficult to predict the subsidy you're going to receive in a couple of years. I mean, with natural gas um, production in the United States at an all-time high, you know, retail rates are going to be driven down. That's going to affect the subsidy. Retail rates by themselves are, all, are often inadequate also without additional uh, incentives. So there's that gap as well. So unlike EEG, we got variable subsidies and they're not targeted. Renewable portfolio standards. This, I think, it, these are the most important uh, laws governing uh, renewable energy development in the United States. Um, 35 states plus DC, uh, Washington, uh, have these policies. Um, many create re solar renewable energy credits and then require utilities to purchase those credits to cover the amount of electricity they supply. Um, they phase in over time. Um, the Maryland General Assembly just accelerated um, this state's uh, policy. So now it's 2% of all electricity supplied in Maryland needs to be covered by SRECs uh, by 2020. It used to be by 2022. And again, I identify this as almost a loophole because FERC has found this is not requiring utilities to enter into a wholesale, wholesale transaction. In reality, what they said is that since renewable energy credits represent the environmental attributes of the electricity, you're requiring them to purchase something separate from the electricity. But actually, just recently, in, in uh, April, uh, FERC said that it does not have jurisdiction over unbundled um, renewable energy credits. So these are credits that are separate from the electricity, like, for example, in Maryland. But it said that it would have jurisdiction over bundled uh, renewable energy credits. So these are, this is one the law requires that when a um, electricity supplier purchases renewable energy credits, they also have to purchase the electricity. And I think that could present some problems for some states' uh, policies. Um, just one select issue, price volatility. I mean, these are market commodities. Oversupply can lead to price drops. Um, it's great uncertainty. You have to have a, uh, you know, uncertainty requires a, uh, a higher uh, return. Um, also, you're going to have third parties offering upfront payments for uh, renewable energy credits. In order to hedge against this uh, volatility, they're going to depress the price. So you have this uh, issue with targeting the prices properly. Um, so some final thoughts. There's obviously huge potential in the United States. I think individually states do have political uh, will to do this. The problem is that the Federal Power Act and PURPA limit growth, and uh, states are unable to recreate the factors that I outlined for, uh, for all of you. Some possible solutions. You have a federal feed and tariff. I think kind of an interesting solution would be to actually return authority to the states and say, okay, you know, we're not going to mandate that you, ha that, you know, you all are going to have to comply with a uh, feed and tariff, but if you want, do whatever you want. You could also do a combination of both, so have the federal feed and tariff be kind of a floor and then allow states to create a stricter or a more progressive uh, tariffs. Also at the local level, and then Hawaii, um, Texas, and Alaska, um, be because they're not interconnected with the grid, they can also um, do their own uh, policies and also municipal utilities as well, so at the local level. But that's not going to be a targeted, comprehensive approach. 
So that's it. Does anyone uh, have any questions? US, um, it seems like we have to come up with a lot of sort of makeshift solutions to fill in uh, where, where uh, uh, countries with more centralized authority don't, don't have that issue. Um, and we're going to now hear about one of those countries, um, or, or the role of inter, uh, renewable energy in international law. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Mark uh, Katins Eritia. Um, she is, uh, as I say, a univers uh, she's a professor uh, at the um, uh, University of Barcelona, where she has a doctorate uh, of law and a law degree. Um, she uh, focuses on European community law, community environmental law, public international law, and international environmental law. Uh, and has a long list of publications to her name. She's been a professor at University of Barcelona since 1991. So it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, Mar Maria del Mar Campins Aritia. Well, Mar, thank Bienvenidos. you. Bienvenidos. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to start, uh, well, apologizing for my English. It's not probably as good as yours, but Probably my Spanish is better than, than yours, in that case. So uh, the research question I'm trying to answer in this uh, short presentation is to what extent renewable energy is in need of a legal global international framework in order to guarantee its contribution to sustainable uh, development. Uh, to do that, I will go from the international legal framework then I will focus on the European Union um, uh, framework, legal framework too. And finally, I will try to show how uh, renewable energies has a role, has a role to play uh, not, only as, uh, not only in the sustainable development framework, but also, at least from the perspective of the European Union, also for the security and energy supply or energy security. Hmm? As for the international framework, well, there is really a need for a specific international framework. There is a need from the uh, economic perspective because of the gap between uh, global demand and supply of oil, let's say the case of China into the international market or the specific situ special situation of the Middle East. Uh, but there is also a need of uh, renewable energies promotion at the international level too because of environmental reasons. Think about the climate change consequences. And there is also a need, of course, from the social perspective, just let's think about this uh, half, uh, one and a half billion people with no access to electricity. Uh, in terms of uh, global uh, primary energy supply, renewable energies uh, accounted in 2008 for about 13% of total primary energy supplies, being uh, the bioenergy the largest contributor. In 2010, these uh, contributions increased up to the uh, 16%, which shows that finally uh, the sector actually performs quite well despite of the economic uh, crisis and that uh, finally the, the, the deployment of renewable energies has been increasing rapidly in the recent years. So with that context, what about the international framework? Actually, the international framework we have right now, it's a very, let's say, not very, but maybe quite poor international framework, at least in terms of effectivity. Here I just put uh, the, the, I tried to show from three different perspectives concerning three different international fora. First of all, which means the United Nations fora, including climate change negotiation and United Nations uh, bodies. As for the climate change negotiations, I'm not a not going to go deeper in that because there are other panels talking about that, but what we have right now after uh, coming from Copenhagen to uh, the last meeting in Durban, and we are going to see what's happened in Qatar, but what we really have right now is a progressive weaken of uh, mandatory targets. Actually, we have no legally binding commitments for the next period yet. We neither have uh, any treaty up to uh, 2015. As for the United Nations bodies, what we have is uh, the Agenda 21 and the uh, Commission of Sustainable Development trying to do some work, but 
in general terms, it can be qualified, can be considered as a, uh, not very, not very successful. Actually, uh, we can say it has been quite a, a great failure. Also, as Professor Hoda already just put it, it's a mostly dead process as for the Commission of Sustainable Development at least. Then we also have other kind of initiative, the Jonas Work Plan of Implementation or even the 2012 International Year of Sustainable Energy for All. But those are non-mandatory or non um, non uh, banding uh, any kind of uh, activities or actions. As also for the United Nations, we have also these United Nations energy clusters, let's say mixing the United Nations Development Program with the World Bank or the United Nations Environmental Program with the Food and Agriculture Organization and with the UNESCO or the United Nations Industrial Development Organization with the, inter, uh, the, the energy international uh, agency, for instance. But all of them, take it all together, we cannot talk about a great successful. On the other hand, we also have this uh, international fora focus or mainly uh, address it to deal with renewable energies. This is the case for the International Renewable Energy Agency, which has been uh, created in 2009 and which is enforced since 2010, so probably it's too soon yet to talk about it. But in any case, at the first picture, it shows two specific, um, two specific um, weakened points. First of all, it's a membership. Even if there are about 100 member states, there are some very, very important actors, some very, very important interested states like Russia, Canada, China, Brazil, Venezuela, which are not member yet of the uh, organization. But then there is also a, a problem with the focus, which is that it's a very, very limited focus on climate change issues. Same thing more or less for the International Energy Agency. Membership is also very limited, actually. Membership is open to uh, OECD countries only, which means that there are quite a lot of countries outside the process. And here the focus, the material focus, it's also kind of uh, limited because it mainly deals just with uh, energy security issues, but not with uh, other uh, big, uh, big issues. So finally, the... Uh, let's say the economic, the financial trade uh, organization like the World Bank and the World Trade Organization. As for the World Bank, uh, it really is a, a, an important actor and actually uh, it has been supporting quite a lot uh, developing countries in promoting renewable energies or energy, uh, both with financial and non-financial instruments. And uh, for the World Trade Organization, as the same thing that uh, the World Bank actually, it has no uh, environmental dimension. The environment is not their own, uh, their own uh, objective. So it means that uh, renewable energies are going to be taken from another perspective. There is a big debate on, or big debate, there is a debate on whatever treating them as a goods, then applying the GATT agreement and the uh, Article 20 exception, or uh, considering them as a services, don't then get, go to the GATT agreement, another the exception, and even all the questions related to the subsidies and countervailing measures with the prohibited and the um, actionable uh, sub, uh, subsidies. So, in general terms, then, for the international framework, we see that it's kind of, um, it's not a very, very strong one. What about the European Union? Actually, the European Union needs to find energy alternatives to produce low carbon energy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in order to comply with the uh, Kyoto Protocol commitments. And that's will be done in two different dimensions. Uh, from the internal dimension with the internal, uh, the energy internal market, the European Union energy internal market, and also from the external dimension with the, a kind of energy policy, external energy policy, that's something hard to say in the case of the European Union, but actually let's put that, that like that right now, where we are gonna see the main issue, it's the energy dependency. Both uh, sides, uh, internal and external, both dimensions have been a little bit more reinforced by the Lisbon Treaty, which has included a specific article, Article 194, uh, that will allow the European Union to develop a real energy uh, policy. 
From the internal policy, or from the internal side, uh, there are quite a lot of different documents concerning renewable energies. Most of them are uh, communications from the European Commission, but we also have a binding, a binding mandatory uh, tool, which is Directive uh, 2009-28. And concerning common framework for the promotion of energy from renewable sources. Uh, well, what's the main um, aim of such a directive? It's uh, what's called the 2020-20 uh, objective, reducing 20% of greenhouse gas uh, emissions below 20% uh, below 1990 levels, depending on what's going to happen with other actors uh, that can go up to 30% or 50% by, 20, uh, by 2020, by, by 2020, uh, improve energy efficiency up to 20%, also by 2020, and increase the share of energy from renewable sources up to 20% by 2020. Uh, how? That's going to be done at the European Union level and according to the directive. Uh, that will be done mainly by the establishment of a European Union global progressive targets, which are now going to be distributed between member states, which will also have their own national domestic progressive targets. Uh, member states are going to be, um, or member states should submit a national renewable energy action plan. Such a plan should uh, identify um, uh, all uh, the percent, percentages of renewable energy to be procured for, uh, for uh, electricity, for transport, for heating, for cooking. It should also identify technologies and activities in order to meet uh, these uh, targets. And it also should identify what's going to happen in case of failure of, to meeting all these um, targets. In order to make for the member states a little bit easier to achieve those uh, targets, uh, the directive uh, established kind of what we call flexibility measures, so measures that will facilitate the work of member states. This is the case for the statistical transfers, so the possibility to, to exchange uh, quotas of um, renewable energies between member states and the uh, joint projects between member states or between member states and third, uh, third countries. The point here, as for the internal side, actually, is what's going to happen beyond 2010. Because, um, finally, the document of the European Commission called 2015 European Union Energy Roadmap shows that renewable energies will play a major role in uh, European Union energy policy. And even if, at the moment, the European Union is controlling step by step how member states are doing, the, 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 the true thing is that at the end of the day, there will be probably a need of a little bit more coordination and probably leading to a more harmonization. So that means that it will be also uh, a need of opening the debate on carbon emission reduction targets, energy renewable uh, renewable energies or target or efficiency target. Something that uh, will mean that uh, all member states should be on the board because finally the treaty established the unanimity in order to uh, adopt the decision, the decision process, um, decision making process. So as for the external side, here the main issue is the Actually, the dependency, the European Union uh, is completely dependent on external actors in terms of um, oil and gas. Actually, in 2009, the European Union was importing about more than the 50%. It's supposed to be increased uh, up to 70% in 2030. And here the point is not only that we are completely dependent on, on third actor, but the problem probably here is from who the European Union is depending on, and that means Russia mainly. And Russia is a great uh, neighbor, it's a big neighbor, uh, it's a great neighbor too, but not, not always the most friendly neighbor for the European Union. So that means that there is a point here which is that the uh, European Union has made a priority of energy security, and the European Union needs to deal with that 
point specifically, uh, considering what is the situation. I just want to point, make the point here, if you just look at this, uh, all this um, shaded area here, uh, all this shaded area actually shows the territories that should be avoided for transport of oil and gas. And all these pink and less pink areas are supposed to be territories where are or territories which are completely under no state control. So, if you put that on the, on the big scene, you can see how vulnerable position the European Union has in terms of energy supply. That's why the European Union needs to work, and I'm going to the last part of my presentation, needs to work on a specific um, areas in order to ensure that a little bit more friendly countries can help to avoid all these specific uh, and all these uh, complicated areas. That is on the that happens on the framework or what is the neighborhood European Union neighborhood policy, which uh, allow me to to show how promotion of renewable energies can help sustainable development in terms of. European Union internal policy, but can also have or can also have a role as a, a tool for state stability and conflict prevention. Uh, and that's what's going to happen with Central Asia. You can say, why Central Asia? Why a case study on Central Asia in that sense? Well, because Central Asia right now, as you can see on the, on, the, on the previous slide, if you see in all this pipeline for gas and oil, the northern, the southern, the, the, the northern, well, the northern, not the southern um, pipelines and the Nabucco pipelines, all this geostrategic area here are uh, supposed to be the future for the European Union when it tries to avoid, uh, let's say, to deal, or to be completely dependent of uh, the, um, the Russian Federation. So Central Asia is supposed to be a, a, a transit area even a rich area, but it's a transit area for the European Union. And actually, uh, Central Asia is, uh, has been considered by the European Commission the essential, the essential neighbor of the European Union neighborhood countries. So in that sense, uh, that's going to be an area where the European Union has been going to work in terms of stability and in terms of secure what the European Union itself calls the ring of friends, so the ring of friends surrounding the European Union that needs to be stable and that needs to be peaceful. Uh, but the point is that uh, the Central Asian states are kind of a particular states. Uh, uh, what I'm talking about for, I mean, maybe probably all of you know the area, but what I'm talking about is all these five stand, what's called the five stand, the Kazakhstan, the Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, all these states that are independent state right now, but they have never been before. So uh, here the point is that the European Union needs to make all these uh, states stable. So to do that, it needs to rely on uh, affordable energy also as a prerequisite for economic development, economic development as a prerequisite for stability, and the European Union is supposed to have all the knowledge, but all the experience to produce that result. And in order to avoid the conflicts of our resources in Central Asia that make this uh, area completely uh, unstable. But here the governments on those areas are particular, I say, most of them are authoritarian uh, regimes. Those are countries with a weak legal, social, economic uh, framework, even for promoting alternative energies they still rely completely in the exchange between gas and oil for water, between the downstream states and the upstream states. And then there is also another very important point here, which is the completely political distrust between those states. Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan cannot even stay in the same rooms most of the times. However, those are countries with a great potential in renewable energies, solar, wind, biogas, uh, hydropower stations, and those countries are making renewable energies a component of country modernization strategy. So finally, what's the point of the, for the European Union? The point for the European Union at the end of the day is that 
The cooperation with, that, uh, with that area should go also in the way of promoting the use of renewable energies as additional source of energies. That's going on that way. The problem right now is that the European Union is relying mainly in large infrastructures of uh, renewable energies or not so renewable. Let's say all the damming on the Emudaria River, like kind of uh, Rogun Hydropower Dam in Kazakhstan or Kambarata Dam in Kyrgyzstan, etc. So very big, 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 huge infrastructures. When it should probably go on the way to promote much more community-based uh, renewable energy projects like uh, solar energy or hydro, small hydropower stations in order to ensure community uh, resources there. So finally, in order to conclude, just uh, concluding with that, uh, at the international level, as international framework for promoting renewable energies, what we have is a lack of teeth and a lack of focus on the international legal framework. Then, at the European Union level, on the internal dimension, we agree that the European Union has a role, important role, relevant role in fostering transition towards a sustainable energy model, but we need a clear and stable regulatory framework beyond 2020 linked to renewable resources availability, technological capacity, taking into account the social and economical environmental environment. And from the external dimension, the most important point is that uh, energy dependency, which leads up to the uh, energy security. In the case study of Central Asia, we just decided that the European Union has a role to play in Central Asia development and Central Asia has a role to play in European Union energy supply. So the European Union needs to double its force, but it has been done that, mainly with the European Union strategy for Central Asia, but the real thing, um, five years later, is that uh, there is no any kind of, uh, there is no uh, a, a real implementation or any kind of positive results of this uh, Central Asia uh, strategy. On the other side, on the contrary actually, what has been happening really is that what is called the dark side of the Europeanization. It means that the uh, uh, Central Asian state have been using all these European Union resources devoted to the promotion of the development, the economic development, the social cohesion, etc., sharing of values of democracy, rule of law, and everything uh, to their own uh, interests or their own very, very domestic local interests. So that was a little bit what I was trying to uh, explain today. So that's the end. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wow, that was very cool. I, uh, you know, I can't, see, I can't help but see some similarities. Uh, you know, we, we, I think all over the world have policymakers often who set goals, um, and there may or may not at the time be a clear plan of implementation. Uh, and then I, I appreciate what you said about, um, you know, well, what happens after 2020? Yeah. What's the next step? Because if we look at the climate science, you know, we, yeah. we do need to have a plan for that as well. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I'm now going to introduce um, Professor Rob Fowler. Uh, professor Fowler is an adjunct professor in the law school at the University of South Australia, having retired in late 2008 after teaching and researching in the field of environmental law in Australia for over 30 years. He continues to teach environmental law part-time at the University of South Australia. He has been the chair of the IUCN Academy of, in of Environmental Law since 2008. The Academy is an international network of over 150 law schools committed to teaching and re uh, research in environmental law. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, very, I'll, I'll, forgo the, I'll forgo the rest of it. Um, and, and I'll ask you to welcome uh, Professor Fowler, who's going to talk about addressing the challenge of sustainable development and the need for a global uh, energy tr a clean energy treaty. Thank Sorry you. Sorry to interrupt the chair. But <laughs> uh, let's welcome Professor Fowler. Uh, look, I'm conscious of the time, so I'm going to try to do this in about 15 minutes. Uh, so we've got plenty of time left for some discussion at the end. And I have to say this is a work in progress. I, even in the time since I um, drew, the up, drew up the abstract for this paper, um, I've continued to think about the, the idea of whether um, the, the kind of gap that Mars identified in the international legal framework for energy is something that might be susceptible to a, a, some kind of international agreement. Um, if I, uh, where is forward on here, is that right? Is that it? No. How do you actually move forward? I haven't. Oh, sorry, I didn't take the instructions beforehand. What's the? Or were you able to do that? I did. Uh, what did you use? 
Oh, okay, okay. Just, just a little yeah, clip. Just, right. yeah. Okay. So, <clears throat> sorry about in, in the time I've got available, I just want to sort of set that question in its context, uh, looking at several matters, discuss a couple of what I think are really key issues that have also been the focal point of a lot of the discussion, particularly in the very first session when we had the report from Rio Plus 20, and then tease out some thoughts about whether and how a, a global renewable energy treaty uh, might be developed and what it might, what it might encompass. Um, what, what's on the screen now is, is material that I think we would all take for granted in a sense, but it's almost important to just remind yourself of the, 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 the extent of the challenge that we've faced in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, to the level needed to try to avoid dangerous climate change, which has been popularly uh, agreed as being anything above two degrees Celsius. And the IPCC back in 2008, um, I'm sorry, I, I did all this this morning, I noticed <laughs> it should be by 2050 in the first line, um, went through its assessment. Um, since then, I think there's been some really excellent work done by the International Energy Agency in suggesting that at the moment the current patterns for the production and consumption of energy are leading us down a pathway that would result uh, if there are no major changes in, in up to six degrees Celsius in global warming uh, by around uh, the end of this century or even earlier. And um, just a couple of months, just in the last month or so, the IEA produced a further report which uh, made the very strong statement that it, the uh, so-called transition energy fuels such as gas are not going to help us to get to the kind of uh, reductions that we need and uh, there are some misconceptions perhaps at the moment in national policy around that idea. And finally, just to remind us that we're really running out of time to deal with this problem. Uh, the urgency of the climate change problem is such that um, we are facing the point where there may be uh, ecological reactions in the form of tipping points that will mean uh, that we lose control of the system to some extent and we lose control of our ability uh, to, to try to bring about changes in that system. The second thing I'd say by way of context is something that is again been, has, has been remarked on repeatedly at this conference uh, and, and in other places and that is that the, uh, the negotiating process uh, on the, under the so-called Bali Roadmap has really struggled to find its direction. And I was present in Copenhagen to, to, to watch that process at a distance um, and to share with many people there the disappointment at the lack of outcomes. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, but uh, even with the, the more positive, um, um, I suppose, the more positive air that surrounded the Durban discussions, where it would, it would seem that as if there was the likelihood of getting the tr negotiations to some extent back on track, the most recent um, discussions in Bonn just a month or two ago have underlined how difficult it is still to get uh, real progress through this current um, negotiating uh, mechanism. And, and, and as a result, there is, I think, a loss of confidence, uh, which is very widespread in that particular approach. Similarly, as we heard in uh, the very first session today, the uh, Rio plus 20 outcomes were well short of what many people had hoped for. And that underlines, I think, in a similar way, the um, the difficulties in promoting and advancing the sustainable ad ag development agenda in the manner that um, it, it's been thought is necessary. So um, the idea that then flowed from that for myself was in terms of looking at what Mars Campion also described in her paper at the outset, the, 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 the relatively um, large vacuum in terms of international law and policy on energy why is it then that we could not envisage something around a global energy treaty uh, that sought to promote renewable energy? Is this something that might, might uh, to use the phrase in English, have legs? It could, it, could it be possible? Since first floating it, I've got to say that uh, my, 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 uh, my thoughts about that have uh, tended to move backwards from the idea, uh, listening to some of the discussion about uh, what is seen as the widespread failure of the global governance system. But um, I'm, I'm not prepared to quite abandon it just yet as I work my way through this research and think a little bit more about how to frame it. Um, and uh, certainly it may be that rather than a hard law instrument, something such as a soft law instrument may be 
the more normal means of starting a process of moving towards uh, some uh, better, better provisions at the international level. One of the things that I think is really important here is the, the, just the whole question of uh, the psychology of changing human behaviour. And there's some really fascinating research that I've been reading around this at the moment. Some of it is actually done by people who are very much experts in marketing and communications who will tell you that uh, trying to get people to change behaviour by threatening them with the dire consequences of climate change is probably the least likely strategy to be effective and that we need to think in a much more positive vein, that the message needs to be what we can do rather than what we cannot do. And I'd suggest that the focus to date in, in, in the, 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 you know, the 20 plus year process of the United uh, Nations Framework Climate Change Convention and, and the Kyoto Protocol has been about what we can't do. What we cannot do any longer is to continue to emit fossil uh, greenhouse gases, gases at the same levels and we have to set targets for their reduction. Uh, uh, what we can do, of course, is moved towards alternatives to those fuels. And something which is framed around that positive message is likely to be better received within the community, uh, by governments at the national and international level. So there is a certain rationale to what I'm proposing which suggests that we need to rethink strategy at the international level in order to message where we're trying to get to in a different way. Um, before I go into the third part of the presentation, which is about, well, how, how could we get to such a treaty, um, I think it's important to just pick up three key factors that really have, in a sense, uh, been very much at the, at the forefront of, of, the, of the difficulties we've faced with both the, uh, the climate change negotiations and the sustainable development agenda. We're no longer talking at the fringes in these particular contexts um, about, even if I take biodiversity, I'm not diminishing the importance of biodiversity in any way, there's a more ready consensus around the need to protect biological diversity than there is around what is essentially a retooling of human civilization. And, and, and that's a massive agenda. We're talking about a radical change uh, in the way in which our societies operate uh, if we are going to move away from fossil fuel dependency to, to some other form of energy source. And that doesn't come easily. Uh, that's not something that just happens overnight and it takes very complex processes to bring it about. It, we, we've seen with information technology that we can bring about these sorts of changes in human society relatively rapidly, including in developing countries where access to technology is often quite extensive. The difference here though is the second factor and that is that there are very deeply entrenched and vested interests who have great deals of economic power and clout and who are using that power to resist change. And we've seen that in this country with the debate in the Congress about a very decent piece of legislation that President Obama was pushing on climate change, which was lost with a, an almost obscene investment in, in, in lobbying against that. I've seen this in my own country in Australia with the debate about our, our particular attempts to, uh, to respond to climate change through what is now a carbon tax system. And, and I think there was to some extent a degree of naivety on the part of those of us who took off to Copenhagen. Uh, looking for and hoping for an outcome there. I don't think people really fully appreciated the extent of the battle that they were going into at the time of Copenhagen and, and, and were not ready for the pushback that came. The third thing which is linked to this is the political paralysis that we are seeing in most of our Western democratic governments at the moment on these matters because of the second factor to some extent and the ability to confuse the science in the media. What we're finding is that governments are really struggling to get a position on, 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 on uh, climate change, which is an advanced one. And, and we see in this country uh, the difficulty with the Republicans at every point um, opposing all elements of climate change policy. Even in my own country, where we have now adopted a carbon tax and are now seen as something of a leader in the field, that's simply because we've got a balanced government, a government which is, uh, uh, has the balance of power simply with the support of a small number of Green uh, Party politicians who have forced that government into a position that it would almost, well, it went to the election committing not to take action on climate change and had to reverse that position after the election when it found itself in that political situation. You put those three factors together, they're enormously powerful factors and they explain, I think, not only the failure of the climate change process or, or the, the, the stalling of it, but also the same factors are absolutely applicable to what happened in Rio as well. These are, these are major considerations to have to get past. 
Having said that, I felt some real concerns about the sorts of things that were being said on Monday about the international governance system and, and our now extremely well-developed system of international environmental law and multilateral agreements. I think we've got to be very careful not to lose confidence in the system that has been developed, which operates at multiple layers and, and, and in great detail across a whole spectrum of, uh, of environmental laws and natural resource law management. And yes, we have these difficulties in these particular areas of climate change, energy and sustainability, because they are the bottom line issues. But I think we can't afford to lose confidence in that system of MEAs. We must maintain our faith in it, and we must look at ways to use that system differently to try to get better outcomes at the international level on these particular issues. So I, I, in a sense, finding myself in a slightly different space there in terms of urging some caution, I guess we would say in English, to not throw out the baby uh, with the bathwater. Um, so where are we going then um, with this matter? Um, I, I, in, in, in thinking about this paper, I actually came across an article, and I've cited it a little bit later, by an Australian colleague, Neil Gunningham, uh, who's just published it in the first issue of Transnational Law, a very good journal that has just uh, been, had its first issue just released. And uh, Neil and I worked together in Australia for nearly eight years uh, in a centre for environmental law with our third colleague, Ben Bohr. And we always tended to find ourselves almost accidentally thinking in the same directions. And I was almost appalled to read, that, and, and I've got to avoid the plagiarism issue at this moment, that Neil had somehow come to a similar kind of analysis to myself uh, just in the last few months. And he, he has in this article, um, first of all, I think very nicely summarised the key elements of energy law and policy in terms of what are essentially competing, competing factors. The fact that we need through energy law and policy to address energy poverty, and I'm speaking now particularly at the energy level, but this can also translate in many instances to the national level. And this is where in that context we see the emerging uh, concept of a right to sustainable energy, uh, that in order to ensure access to energy there should perhaps be recognition at the international level of such a right. Uh, in terms of energy sec uh, security, uh, one of the things that troubles me greatly in terms of my country, and I think is, is also of concern here and elsewhere in Canada and even the UK, is in terms of energy security, the sudden rush to the so-called transition gases um, through uh, extraction by means such as coal shale gas and, 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 and the complete um, absence of appropriate environmental controls on this activity. So we're having this desperate urge out of a need for energy security to find these alternative fuels. It's not even clear that they are uh, in the end, ultimately, if you do all the calculations and take into account all of the fugitive emissions, likely to be less greenhouse polluting than the, than the fossil fuels they're purportedly replacing. And, and the science on that is still, I think, out. So the, the energy security is a, is a competing factor. And of course, the third one is, I've said decarbonisation, that's perhaps an extreme, but certainly low carbon fuels as a means of lowering greenhouse gas emissions. And there, uh, perhaps there are uh, four major strategies. I'm going to go straight to the fourth one of renewables. Uh, I quickly dismiss CCS and nuclear. Um, we won't get into the debates about that, and I certainly support energy efficiency, but I want to just simply talk about renewable energy for a, for a moment and hopefully finish in a couple of seconds. Um, further to what Mars was saying before, um, there's a very long quote here. Um, uh, but I, uh, well, sorry, I'll come back to that later. Well, the first thing is just the technical aspects of renewable energy. What could it do at the global level? I found a fascinating study uh, by some German scientists based in Stuttgart uh, in 2009. But what they did was they went out and measured uh, the solar capacity to receive um, energy uh, in, in solar form on all of the land mass of the Earth. They went country by country, continent by continent. It was a brilliant study, I thought, and, and what it discovered was that, in fact, there's an enormous uh, capacity to use concentrated solar power uh, to capture energy, and we, we all know the sun generates m many times more <laughs> energy than we need, but that you could probably use with, with links gr uh, around grids uh, on an international scale. You could use this means, if you could afford it, and I, I'll leave the economic equation to one side for a moment, you could use this to get uh, um, renewable energy to a large percentage of the Earth's uh, surface. Um, Siberia and the lower parts of South America are out of the equation, but for the large part it is possible on, on the current technology 
to power up the globe with concentrated solar thermal uh, on the basis of the amount of solar energy that reaches the Earth. And the, the, the question is more a one of cost than technology, in, in fact. Um, at a regional level, I was very interested in Mars analysis. Uh, many of us would know about some of the work that's being done in terms of trying to build relationships between Europe and uh, Northern Africa, uh, and also parts of um, uh, Central Europe um, in order to provide additional um, power to Europe. And again, this is not just in the realms of hypothesis. There are now very large private commercial investors looking at some of the schemes in North Africa in terms of their capacity to power up Europe. In my own country, a very interesting port report called Beyond Zero Emissions calculated, and this is done by a group of young engineers, all under 30, very forward looking, very exciting people, who, who worked out that we could power um, uh, Australia by uh, 2020. Within 10 years, we could take ourselves completely off of fossil fuels by using a combination of concentrated solar, photovoltaics, wind uh, and some hydro. And, and, and the only problem with it is the cost again. It, the cost at this stage was something like 40 billion a year for 10 years. That sounds massive, but the payback time was something like 25 to 30 years, at which time you would have your system completely paid off. And this is where the positive image needs to come again, because if you start thinking about some of the great schemes that we've needed to do in terms of post-war reconstruction, uh, energy development in my country, the Snowy Mountains scheme, the dollars actually aren't so bad. Uh, especially with the costs coming down. And this is the kind of positive message that needs to be conveyed, in my view. So where are we? Current state of international energy law and policy. I found a quote from Mohamed El Barade, the uh, former head of the International Atomic Energy Agency, which I thought summed it up quite nicely. And uh, in terms of the institutions we have at the moment, I think IRENA in particular, the International Renewable Energy Agency, which I know Dick Ottinger has had some um, good dealings with, is, is definitely a promising uh, development, a very exciting one, and they're doing some very good work. But at the moment, I think we can say with some safety that we do not have a, a sort of central institution focused at the global level on energy, nor do we have a legal framework which really drives anything forward at the international level. So I'll conclude for just two minutes with some, some final thoughts on where I'm at with my thinking on this. There are various options. You've got here the uh, reference to the article by Gunningham on what he calls global governance strategies, which is, in a sense, um, looking at means other than strict legal uh, measures to try to promote renewable energy, a whole range of quite complex measures that are set out in this excellent article that I do commend to you. But you also have the options of treaty and soft law declarations. What, would, what are the sort of things that we could start to think about in terms of such a treaty? Here's just a, a short list. It's, it's a work, as I say, again, it's a work in progress, uh, but it could, for example, seek to encapsulate a recognition of the right to energy in order to deal with that question of access to energy. Um, the question of targets, perhaps they could be mandatory if they were in a treaty. They could be voluntary in the way in which we're seeking voluntary commitments at the moment for emissions reductions under the climate change regime. Uh, certainly one area that I think it would be good to see encapsulated in some firmer legal commitment would be to uh, ask countries to stop uh, underwriting fossil fuels by enormous subsidies that continue to take place. In my own country they're calculated by our federal government alone, something like $10 billion a year year with the states we don't even know how much and yet our government says it doesn't actually subsidise fossil fuels, it doesn't even admit to the existence of the practice. Um, a clean energy finance mechanism. There were a number of comments made coming out of the Rio Plus 20 about the money that has now been made available for renewable energy and expressions of concern about the lack of coordination with respect to how uh, to allocate that money. To create some form of finance mechanism under a treaty would provide an avenue for what you'd hope would be prioritised spending. Uh, and then um, finally te technology transfer is always going to be an important aspect. The last thing I would say is that it might be that uh, under such a, an agreement there could be provision for sub-agreements, for want of a better term, for agreements on a regional basis to build, for example, on things like the EU North Africa scheme. So there's just some thoughts there. Um, this, is, this is very early days for me on this work, but uh, I'm, I'm convinced that I'm not going to quite yet give it away. I think I'll still keep sticking at it. Thank you very much. <laughs> 
Thank you for that. That was great. Um, our final presenter today is uh, David, uh, Professor David Hodes. Uh, is a distinguished professor of law at Widener University School of Law on, uh, on the Delaware campus, where he teaches and writes in the areas of climate change law, environmental law, energy and public utility law, administrative law, and, and constitutional law. He is a co-author of Climate Change Law, Mitigation and Adaptation, and has written extensively on sustainable energy, climate change, and environmental law. He currently serves on the editorial board of Natural Resources in the Environment and is a member of the uh, Energy Expert Group of the IUC and Environmental Law Commission. He chairs the Delaware's, uh, Delaware Governor's Energy Advisory Council and was responsible for drafting Delaware's 2009 to 2014 Energy Plan. Uh, Professor Hodes is a member of the IUC and Academy of Environmental Law eJournal Editorial Board um, and uh, a member Thanks. by appointment. Uh, well, of, uh, of, of, of uh, the, um, by appointment of the president of the ABA uh, Standing Committee on Environmental Law. Please uh, join me in welcoming Professor David Hodes. Some of those things are, are past. I don't do them all at the same time. So I, uh, I added a picture because I think you have to have pictures for PowerPoint. And this is the um, Macondo well um, uh, burning out in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, which is appropriate, I guess, for energy. It's really quite a, a well-composed picture. So I'm going to want to talk about the uh, global law of sustainable energy. And to start with, I, um, I want to thank uh, Mart and Rob for uh, filling in a lot of things that I would otherwise talk about, um, leaving me with uh, uh, substantially less, which is, I suppose, good since I'm last. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Bob Percival and Tsming Yang for the phrase global law. And uh, I'm really trying, basically thinking in terms of energy law uh, the way uh, they were thinking in terms of environmental law. That in fact at the local state level uh, there are now appearing to be um, sort of commonly accepted techniques and policies uh, which actually is where the work gets done. Um, and uh, so I'm going to start uh, with some depressing stuff, but I, I, I do think that there's a lot of opportunity, um, even more actually than um, Rob suggested. And we'll start with a quote I saw from uh, uh, Nathan Lewis, who wrote an article in um, a journal that Caltech publishes about uh, global energy, and he says, uh, he may have stolen it from somebody else, the, the, uh, the Stone Age did not end for a lack of stones. And the fossil fuel age will not end for a lack of fossil fuels. Uh, natural resource economists teach that as the price goes up, uh, we spend more to get it out, and new technology involving fracking uh, of gas and oil uh, has basically uh, expanded significantly the size of many fields in, in the United States that were thought to be close to dead. Uh, and now we are uh, producing, for the first time since 1971 or 72, the United States is now producing more oil this year than it did in the previous year. Uh, and an incredible amount of natural gas um, uh, in, in Marcella Shell. So if it won't end for lack of fossil fuels, uh, why, how will it end? Well, it'll end when there's, uh, we decide to make a paradigm shift. And um, that's sort of what Bob, uh, Rob was talking about. And that's, that's hard to do um, because no one can imagine what it would be like um, without gas or oil. Because um, we now use, I mean, simple, the, the use of um, motor vehicles right now has expanded the human ability to transport goods 60 times beyond what was true when we had oxen. And in fact, we still rate our cars in horsepower. So just imagine your car, if that car was available to Queen Elizabeth I, and let's say it's just a, you know, a Honda or a small Corolla, 140 horsepower, no poop, you just put the gas in the tank, 
that car would have been the greatest thing in the history of the world, especially with air conditioning and um, heat, um, which wasn't it. So we just take all this for granted uh, because fossil fuels are basically cheap, and why well, won't this there? So we've started talking about sustainable development for a long time, and uh, I would propose that from the beginning, uh, energy has been the stepchild, the unwanted stepchild in the international negotiations, um, trying to move away from the elephant in the room uh, metaphor. So the 1972 Stockholm Declaration makes no mention of energy. Uh, none of the other documents that were soft law documents between that and unsaid mention energy. The Rio Declaration um, does not mention energy. Agenda 21 does not have a chapter on energy. It has a few uh, sporadic mentions in other substantive areas about energy. Uh, and that was not inadvertent. Um, as Nick Robinson has uh, written uh, in his history of what happened at Rio, um, the removal of energy uh, was basically a negotiated item um, because of some of the countries that, the OPEC countries and the like, that didn't want to have it in there. Uh, so we created this uh, commission coming out of Rio, uh, the Commission for Sustainable Development, and eventually it decided to um, address energy. And so in its ninth meeting in 2001, it had energy as a theme. Uh, and this was a meeting that was well informed on sustainable energy. And Dick Ottinger was involved in, uh, in some of the uh, pre-meeting work. And I had a privilege to be involved a little bit. There were all kinds of ad hoc specialists, gathered facts, a uh, wide range of participation from civil society, business, scientific communities, world, trade unions, local authorities, all participated, provided a tremendous amount of input on policies and facts, and uh, in, support, in support of the general theme, UNDP came out with a major work uh, called the World Energy Assessment, which basically assessed uh, sustainable energy uh, issues, um, around the world, uh, issues of energy and poverty, and made very specific policy recommendations. Um, and that was led by uh, Jose uh, Goldenberg and uh, uh, Thomas, I think it's Thomas uh, Johansson, uh, uh, who are among the world leaders in energy policy. And at CSD9, it was agreed that we would return to this topic at CSD15 in 2007, and in the meantime, we'd work on implementing the policies agreed upon at CSD9, and I, they are long and technical, and they make up all the best practices that people in the world think of for energy efficiency and renewables. Um, a year earlier than that, uh, at the UN, CSD14 meeting uh, began what was a two-year quote, implementation cycle to review what progress has been made since um, in, in the field of energy or sustainable development, uh, industrial development, air pollution, and some interrelated topics such as um, climate change. And this first uh, review year was, the, was also information gathering and progress evaluation with respect to Agenda 21, the Millennium Development Goals, and it developed a lot of good information relying upon the base that had been built up in 2001 um, through the sustainable energy work uh, uh, out of UNDP and CSD9. Um, and so they were ready for the act, policy action meeting uh, at CSD15 where the rubber was gonna meet the road and we would have an international law, uh, international certainly policy framework for sustainable energy. And um, CSD 14 uh, was dominated by energy issues. It had a wealth of presentations and frank and sobering scrutiny of energy issues. And there was a consensus of a sense of urgency and, and that the cost of inaction was becoming very steep. And so it really set the stage for the policy measures to meet the energy challenges that uh, were outlined 
and by consensus agreed to in 2006. And I would uh, suggest, and I, I sort of mentioned, um, I guess in Brazil, that when CSD 15 occurred, basically sustainable energy became mostly dead um, in the uh, Princess Bride sense, although it may now be totally dead at the international level, sort of follow up on what Rob was saying. So CSD 15 failed to meet its objectives. There was a complete collapse of international efforts to s promote sustainable energy. It was also a harbinger of how fragile, if not broken, the international climate change negotiation process was because many of the same issues that the, um, are being discussed at the various COPs were central to what was going on here. Um, and the broad agreement that had been on policies for the issues of energy for sustainable development uh, was, it was sort of generally agreed uh, on these big issues, but they divided on key points. And one of the ministers said at the end, the conference is a joke. Well, it probably was. What happened at it? It was a train wreck, a total train wreck. There was no agreement on any topic. Not one piece of agreement. All of the prior consensus principles uh, were no longer consensus principles. There was not agreement on anything. They could not even issue a report of what happened. Um, there was no agreement on how or when the CSD would ever review energy in the future or if they would ever meet again on this topic then there was no agreement on following up and on any of the interlinked issues for energy, sustainable development, air pollution, or climate change. There was agreement on only one thing, the date of the next CSD meeting, which was going to relate to farm policy in 2008. That was the only thing, that one sentence. They agreed on the date and the place for the next meeting. Um, what were the areas of disagreement? Well, they could not agree any longer on the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities, which we all thought was core to the UNFCC. There was no agreement on, at any level for any targets or timetables for increase even the role of renewable energy efficiency and access to energy. There was no agreement on how, when, it, and whether to re even to review progress in achieving sustainable energy goals. Um, or how to measure it. Uh, there is no agreement whether the World Health Organization guidelines should even constitute minimum air quality standards around the world. There is no agreement on what standards should govern aviation and maritime air pollution. There was no agreement on the role of the um, most recent IPC findings, which was uh, number four. Uh, you know, uh, uh, or of the role of uh, what would happen post-Kyoto, that was not discussed, on any technical and financial assistance, or the role of market instruments. There was not even an agreement any longer on principle two of the Rio Declaration. That was not agreed and agreed upon point that could even go in the report as one sentence that we agreed upon. There was no agreement on whether economic development should take priority over and be separate from sustainable development principles or that they, which required the balancing of environmental needs and quality. There was no longer any agreement on sharing intellectual property. Um, that was a serious disagreement. There was no agreement on whether there would be increased money for financial assistance to developed countries for infrastructure, no agreement on capacity building for education and skills development, no agreement on even what would be defined to be a sustainable pattern of production and consumption. They couldn't agree on setting the agree on the target of 0.7% donor nation contribution, which was something that had been in the air before. There were no agreements even on what were thought to be uncontroversial measures to support certain countries in Africa. There was no agreement on whether the next review of the interconnected issues for energy and sustainable development um, should be limited to a one-day meeting in 2010 or 2014, 
or whether there should even be a detailed evaluation and measurement of progress at all. And so there is no new, they couldn't even agree on whether the meat, even, even two, to, uh, uh, two or six years later, and so there was no agreement on anything. Uh, the chair tried to put together a take it or leave it text uh, through that the night, but because of the unyielding views of the various uh, representatives, that text was rejected. And as I said, the only agreement, the only thing that came out of that uh, CSD was uh, an agreement that the next um, uh, meeting would be on agriculture, Africa, and land related issues. Um, one observer noted that uh, what happened here was like rearranging the deck. When they did that, like rearranging the deck chairs in the Titanic. So, uh, why are we surprised the climate change talks are stalled? Um, the International Energy Agency has been warning us um, that we're at a crossroads um, and that we need nothing short of an energy revolution. Revolution. This is the agency, by the way, that 10 years ago would not even mention renewables or efficiency as something that was even, they could even think of. And now it dominates their thinking. And it says all governments acting alone or together must steer the world towards a cleaner, cleverer, and more competitive energy system. Uh, time is running out. In the meantime, there's been no progress. Not a single issue left hanging after CSD 15 has been resolved in the sustainable, international sustainable development world. They have not appeared on any formal meeting agenda. International meetings have avoided concrete discussion about how to shift to more sustainable low carbon world economy and are increasingly disconnected from the real world policy, science and law this is the chief economist at the International Energy Agency in 2010. And Rio plus 20 is no exception. Sustainable energy was not on the agenda. If you look at their website, it does mention energy as a topic. If you click on that, you see that there is no substance whatsoever on the next page. Uh, other than some pictures, there is no policy report for that. It was never, it was simply a holding category uh, that somebody put together on the web page. Um, it has no, dis every other topic had discussion papers and substantive elements. Um, the only thing that they did was re refer to the UN 2002 Year of S Sustainable Energy for All. It was a purely superficial uh, treatment and as we the document uh, itself does mention energy in paragraphs 125 through 129, but does nothing more than simply recognize that there are problems and people should find solutions. That, they did agree on that. Um, no proposals whatsoever. However, so I would say uh, at the international level, discussions of energy and climate change face enormous challenges. It's not clear to me, based on this, that we will in fact ever get an agreement on either of them because uh, oil is so fantastic. So let me give you a few, uh, a quick example that I mentioned here on Saturday. Um, so the Macondo BP oil well, you saw that picture in the beginning, uh, cost several billion dollars for BP um, you know, clean up costs and lost equipment and investment. However, if instead of building that well, when we first started planning it, we had put CAFE standards in place that uh, the current ones are in the United States fuel efficiency standards in place, we would have saved 20 to 38 times more oil than the field would produce over its 50 year lifetime, save $1.9 trillion in just capital expenses, uh, and expenses for buying oil, plus uh, saving on not, dr not drilling, avoiding oil spills, saving ecosystem services, would have reduced uh, by 9.6 billion tons CO2 um, emissions. The oil would stay underground 
so why do they why do they drill? In fact, at $100 a barrel, the exist the oil down there is still worth 60 to 90 billion dollars. So even if BP has a total write-off of everything that happened there, they can still make a lot of money on that field. Probably even if it goes bad again, if price, especially if the price of oil goes up. Um, So where is the work going on? Well, there is some quiet work, and it, it actually there was a launch at Rio Plus 20 of the Global Energy Assessment, which came out of uh, UNDP. And it is um, a major work that basically um, reinvigorates what was done in 2001. 2002 in the World Energy Assessment, same people, same policies, and they point to the fact that correct policies and domestic law enormously advance energy efficiency and renewable energy. So uh, a couple quick examples beyond what's up there. In the United States, it turns out that the, what policies you put in place at the state level have dramatic effects on the energy efficiency of the state. So New York and California are about 40% more efficient um, overall than the average uh, state in the United States. Um, and California has calculated that as of uh, 2010, it had saved $78 billion net through energy efficiency investments and had avoided um, uh, I don't have the numbers here, I'd written it up in another paper, uh, but it was about 20 or 30 coal-fired power plants that they would have to build. Um, that was because they put the right policies in place so that people could make money providing energy services. Because right now, in our marketplace, you can't make money not selling your goods. So we need a new, radical new thinking of how we um, direct our, um, our policy. So I want to just mention a, a couple other things in terms of the possibilities. So for instance, and, and also how, how the opportunities that are out there. So in 2007, some work was done to develop providing a light to some of the two billion people in the, United, in the world that don't have any electric light. And they developed, uh, out at U Lawrence Berkeley Lab, developed a one watt LED lamp, a thousand times more efficient than candles or a kerosene uh, flame that could be supported by a small photovoltaic for $25. Uh, since then, they've installed 500,000 units, uh, mostly throughout Africa. 2.5 million people now have light. And the big announcement that came out of UNDP, uh, out of Rio 20, is that they now have four and a half million dollars of funding to push this forward through 2015. Four and a half million. And that will serve, and that, for that they'll get just two million more people served. Um, why are, we, for essentially, and if we had, um, installed those, those lights, then all that kerosene to, and, and petroleum to make candles and, and to burn kerosene wouldn't be used as savings to the poor countries of $47 billion a year. And a reduction, because they use about 1.3 million barrels a day for kerosene, for lamps, and for making paraffin for candles. So the opportunities out there, this is not low front hanging fruit, this is fruit that wants to jump into your hand. But we need the right legal policies in place so that people can make a profit on this. Um, if think, and uh, energy efficiency standards, building codes, low energy light bulbs, or a myriad of, of new policy uh, technologies out there that can um, save us money. And even, we're ready for it, in 2007, UNEP published a handbook 
on drafting laws on energy efficiency and renewable energy resources. It is essentially the global law of sustainable energy. It has examples from around the world. It tells you exactly what to do. It has all kinds of references. Has any of you ever even heard of this book? It was designed so that a local official in a country could immediately put things into effect, like appliance efficiency standards, which give a return of $3,000 for every dollar in administrative costs. Um, so, and this was just, this sits on the shelf somewhere. I only have a copy of it because I wrote the chapter on appliance efficiency standards. So there is right now in place a global law of sustainable energy. None of you know about it. We have to teach it from the grassroots. It is there. It is very effective. But the international, at the international level, it, will be re it is rejected. It has been shunned. It has been beaten to death. But at the local level, through lawyers, law schools, teaching, there, is lot, there are lots of resources, and we can put these, things into, these policies into place in a year or two and start saving and reducing energy and reduce far more, and, and adding renewables, uh, we could possibly go off of fossil fuel. One example as a possible game changer is what's called vehicle to grid cars, which are currently being developed at the University of Delaware, where the car battery is the storage unit for the solar and wind energy, and it can accept electricity and send it back to the grid when needed. It has been connected to the grid and demonstrated to FERC. If you had all your cars hooked up like that, there is enough wind energy on the east coast of the United States to power every car in the United States, and because this would be the backup when the wind doesn't blow, to power the entire east coast of the United States, and then have several times that. Left Professor, over. I do want to just save a time for a, a question That's or all. two. That's Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I, I apologize. I did, uh, I'll take the responsibility for uh, letting all the presenters go on a little bit longer. I just could not bear to interrupt them. It was fascinating. And I, um, I, I, we do have time for one or two questions, and I uh, uh, would love to take some from the audience. Yes, sir. Well, the, um, is this on? Yeah, mm -hmm. I guess it's on now. Um, I attended a couple of the energy meetings in Rio Plus 20, and and uh, might be useful to get David's perspective. Uh, uh, there was, um, at least it seemed to me, a substantial commitment to the idea of expanding access to energy in the what's called the Sustainable Energy for All initiative. Exactly what falls within the category of sustainable energy is a matter of debate and, and certainly some of the energy companies want to see natural gas in that, in that category. But there was also um, at least verbal commitments at Rio of uh, something in the neighborhood of $50 billion towards this effort and a lot of uh, interesting discussions of the health impact, especially uh, from wood smoke uh, for women and children, where the numbers provided were two million premature deaths a year. So uh, I'm perhaps not as, uh, uh, I'm perhaps a little more optimistic that there may be some movement uh, going forward. Uh, I, I would suggest that that's uh, somewhat naive, that first of all, you're, never, you're not going to see that money. Uh, secondly, the problems you described were well known in 1992. They were well known at every time since then. We've had technologies in terms of clean cook stoves uh, for a long time. None of those are being installed. At best, the, and, and the $50 billion over what period of time? For instance, to maintain our existing 
uh, energy infrastructure in the world, we need to invest over $20 trillion just to maintain what we have. So $50 billion over 20 years, $50 billion over that time is, is basically peanuts. It's not organized. If you look at the UN Year for Sustainable Energy website, you'll see that there's actually very little there of substance other than a few general um, high-level statements. The only thing that, uh, and, and the UN was not on this, uh, the Rio plus 20 um, agenda. So the fact that there are pledges you know, maybe their pledge is to put in natural gas pipelines from natural, from natural gas pipeline companies. You know, I don't know what the pledges were from uh, Delaware following it every day and trying to read between the uh, lines and what came out of there and the UN and the like. Um, I don't think it's any more than uh, window dressing. This man in the back. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I'm afraid I don't know your name. The, Mars? Is Mar. that? Mar. Um, I was in Spain a couple of years ago and was quite surprised at the amount of local support for not only deployment of renewable energy generally, but also distributed generation in particular. I, I spoke with a couple of regional and, go, um, and local government officials talking about deploying much, much more distributed, localized energy production. I wanted to know, first of all, was I just talking to the right people or the, uh, a unique group of people in terms of the broader support for renewable energy? And second, whether that support has changed in the past couple of years as Spain has headed into much more difficult economic times? So, so what's happening basically in Spain in terms of renewables right now? Yeah, well, uh, very briefly, uh, Spain has been in Europe one of the states where most, uh, well, at least most relevant in terms of renewable energy. It's not something new. Maybe it was a no, but it's not new. The uh, point here is that uh, renewable energies, in most in Europe as all around the world, are not competitive, actually. So it means that renewable energies in Spain, as in everywhere, needs probably uh, needs uh, the subvention, so needs the grants from the state. And actually, uh, Spain has been producing a very, very strong policy on renewable energy, mainly based on public grants. And uh, that really makes a very nice result, but uh, also discuss, I mean, I mean, very nice result from the point of view of energy policy. Uh, from the point of view of environmental policy has been much more discussed because uh, let's take the case of uh, wind uh, turbines. It's not always tasteful to decide if it's good or bad for the environment. But anyway, Spain has been one of the most uh, active, proactive state in, in, in Europe in that sense. Even for instance, right now, in these uh, offshore wind uh, platforms, Spain has been one of the main uh, actors also in that, on that area. However, that's true that most of the time has been because of the uh, public uh, grants. Right now, the public grants are gone. And since last year, the Spanish government has decided to cut the, 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 the public grants to renewable energy. So, What's going to happen right now is that probably renewable energy is actually the argument is of the, 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 the main reason is supposed to be because renewable energies at certain point are going to be competitive uh, with other energies, but that's probably not true 100 percent. And now we are going to see we probably will uh, have a very, very important uh, decrease on the use of the renewable energy. Actually, uh, two years ago, Spain was one of the states which was uh, estimated to be uh, exceeding their, its own target, uh, the, the, the European Directive 2009 target on renewable energies. And right now the thing has completely stopped. So well, it's difficult to say, but probably that would be uh, a very important effect on the withdrawal of the public grants, for sure. 
I think we probably are, are over and probably need to break uh, at this point. But um, I, I want to thank all of our panelists. I, just before we do. Oh, certainly. Yes, Professor Fallon. Oh, <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, I'd just like to take 30 seconds to provide a short response to David on what is a very different point of position. And I, I just think it might be, if, if we can have leave to do that, I'd be grateful. Um, I, I think that'll be fine. Um, I, I, you know, I think David made very many sound observations about the failure of the international system to, to develop any effective law or policy on, on, uh, on sustainable energy at the moment. Uh, and, and the two points I'd make is this. First of all, that w what David was describing quite rightly was the, the, the current efforts to do that through the vehicle of the Commission on Sustainable Development. Uh, UNEP and, 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 and the Rio Plus 20, which is one line of approach. Uh, the thing that I think has to be borne in mind is that before very long there's going to be enormous pressure coming on nations to save the climate change negotiations uh, in order to avoid what will be perceived as a collapse of the global governance system. And, and, and I think in that context there is actually an opportunity uh, building on what has happened in, say, the, even the five years since 2007 and the CSD with this bottom-up approach uh, to, to actually start to take a fresh look at some of those issues again. I'm not, I'm not idealistic or optimistic about this, but I think we have to look at where that has come from so far and where the action is now switching to. So, uh, you know, some of the things that Lee was pointing out in Rio are signals of, 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 a, of, a, of a, a change. Now, the, the money may or may not Come. We don't know. But I, I think there will be a need if, if, if at the end of this year in Doha there is really a failure to develop an effective agreement uh, heading forward, th there is going to have to be a massive rethink of that whole process. And in that context, uh, there is an opportunity at the least to look at an alternative approach. I just wanted to leave that thought with you. No, I think that's great. Concluding on a more optimistic note, uh, that's great. Um, so let's thank our panelists uh, for amazing presentations. And I, I think uh, some of us may, may be up here and, and available to, uh, to chat if you have additional questions. So thank you so much for your time.